This video has been sponsored by Meso CNC Controllers. If you watched any of my last couple of videos about getting a shiny metal chrome look, then you probably knew it was only a matter of time before you'd see one of these super chrome cars. And hey, I thought it'd be fun for you to see something a little bit different in a redline restoration for once. This is a Stars and Stripes Super Chrome Mustang Stalker from 1976. It's a reissue of the 1975 Mustang Stalker, which itself was a reissue of the Boss Haas from 1970 and 71, although they removed the exposed engine and replaced it with a non-opening hood. Sort of a foreshadowing of things to come, I guess. This is pretty late in the game for me. This car is one of the last cars made in the Redline era, as 1976 is the last year for the Redline wheels. Special Flame Paint had already died in 1972. The Stars and Stripes are no coincidence either. 1976 was America's Bicentennial, with the nation turning 200 years old, so there was a lot of patriotic items made this year, including three other painted patriotic Hot Wheels models, including the American Tipper, the American Hauler, and the Formula 5000. There are also four military vehicles this year, one of which is the Army Staff Car, which is highly sought after today, and commands a pretty steep price as it was only included in the Military Machines gift set. But anyway, I digress. This car is in what I like to call a heavily played with state. Most of the chrome has been removed from the roof and the wheels are pretty chewed up. So it's my guess it was played with on some child's driveway where it spent a lot of time upside down, skating across the concrete. After taking it apart, I could see that the windshield and interior plastic were still in decent shape. I believe the chrome on these is real chrome, or at least it acts like real chrome, flaking off just like I remember real chrome doing in my childhood. Real or not, the first thing I'll do is dip the car in the electro polisher to remove the oxides on the exposed metal. I don't see any reason to try and remove the chrome. It is protecting the underlying metal after all. So I'll move on to surface prep. You can see here that the remaining chrome is nice and shiny after the electro polishing bath. However, the roof is still a mess with some of the chrome flaking off and small pits all over it. I'll first try triple out still wool to remove the remaining chrome from the roof, but ended up graduating to 400 grit sandpaper off camera to fix the pitting and chrome issues. After that, I painted the car in gray primer, and after that tried, I wet sanded the primer with 2000 grit. After the car was dry, I began airbrushing it just like in the Groomobile video, which I'll link to if you want to see more of this. This car ended up being a lot more difficult than the Groomobile. In fact, I had to repaint it about six times before I got the result I liked. The main issue is that the paint has to be wet for the metal effect to work. To get it wet, you have to apply a thick layer really fast, which if you're not careful will drown out the details and even run if too much is applied. So it sort of ends up being a balancing act you have to perform and get right for the entire car all at once because if one side dries before you're done repainting the other, the overspray from the side you're working on will dull the side that you just dried. Thus a vicious cycle is created as you run all over the car chasing dull spots while creating them at the same time. That all being said, once you get it, man does it look nice. This will need about two days of drying time before I move on to clear coating it with clear spectra flame paint which is just clear urethane paint. A lot of people ask me where to get this. You can order it from the redlineshop.com. I think some hobby shops sell urethane paint also, but you'll have to look. The urethane clear won't dull the ink I applied as long as it too goes on wet, which is not as difficult to do as the ink. After several coats, I'll set it aside to dry for at least 24 hours. With the shiny surface preserved, I can now look to add on the Stars and Stripes water slides, which I also purchased from the Redline shop. Yeah, I guess I'm doing a lot of free promotion for the Redline shop, but once again, I promote the things I like. That and my printer can't print white, so buying these is much easier. I assume you could print white by swapping out the black ink for white ink, but I have never found a white printer ink that would work in a inkjet printer. If you happen to know of some, then let's talk down in the comments. These images are printed on clear decal paper, so I'll need to use a sharp razor and cut around the image as close to the image as possible. Once this is done, the decals are cut to size and then placed in warm water until they loosen from the white card. Then they are slid into place with an X-Acto knife and a small paintbrush. Water slides are not hard, but they do require a lot of patience as you are constantly fighting the surface tension of water. They make solvents like Microset that help with this, but I typically just deal with the water. Once the decal is in place, it's important to get all the water out from under it and to smooth out any wrinkles. Bubbles can be removed by lancing them with a sharp object. I like to use an old airbrush needle 
and then smooth them out with a paintbrush. After everything's in place, you can then apply some microsol to flatten and sort of dissolve the decal into the surface of the car, hiding the transition points. This is sort of a must that the scale these cars are at, as omitting it will make the decal stand out, and not in a good way. When the microsol fully dries, I can start clear coating again. Here the idea is to bury the decal in the clear coat. This protects the decal and also brightens it. Here the clear coat is also performing one more function, the illusion of depth and metal. By creating a shiny clear surface over a shiny metal surface, I can actually get the metal surface to look more shiny than what it would look like without the clear coat over it. It's all just an illusion, but you can see later when I compare it to another real super chrome car that it does indeed work. After another 24 hours of cure time, I can polish the clear coat to remove any dust and orange peel that might exist. Again, this is really important as I need as glossy a surface as I can get. I also have to be careful not to eat through the clear and into the decals. Luckily that didn't happen here. After polishing is done, the body is ready and I can start working on other parts of the car such as the base. The base looks pretty much like every other base I've worked on, lots of oxidation. Unlike the early red lines, by 1976 Mattel had abandoned all the bent axle suspensions and was using straight axles just like they do today. These straight axles were held in place by crimping the metal on the base around the wire axle. There's no easy way to remove these axles that I know of. I removed them by grinding away the metal crimp with a spherical burr tool until it releases the wire. Now that the wheels are off, I can go about dipping the base in the electro polisher to remove all that oxidation. The polisher tends to leave a slight haze of the metal that I can easily remove with some rubbing compound and a toothbrush to get it nice and shiny. The old wheels on this car are pretty much shot and it's unlikely I could restore them to the standard I put into the body, so I need some new wheels. Since nobody's making repo wheels and axles for these cars, I have two options. I can steal them off of a vintage car, or I can steal them off of a modern reproduction car. Of course I'm going to go with the second option as destroying these only brings up the value of all the rest that collectors are storing in their attics. You're welcome. Mattel's made several reproduction redline cars over their 50 year history and these are just some of the most recent. However, you can still find tons of cars from their 25th anniversary for cheap that you can use and are usually much cheaper than these, which probably says something about all the ones stored in your attic. But I digress again. To hold the axles in place, I'll use a small dab of super glue. Here's a good example of a time to use thick or gel super glue as thin glue will creep to the wheels via capillary action and glue them to the axle. So if you have some, use the gel super glue or an epoxy. I swear I'm not using Sharpies just to troll you guys. I just don't see the need to spend a lot of money on a pen that does relatively the same thing. If the Sharpie fades in 20 years, I can just reapply it. If I decide to remove it later, then all I need is a Q-tip and acetone. So looking at the interior, I can see it needs a good wash and also some flashing removed. This is probably a good time to bring up quality control, or the lack thereof. As I mentioned before, in 1972, Mattel brought out the last Petroflame cars and only seven new models. They discontinued pretty much all the cars going back to 1968, with a few exceptions. This is also the year they moved all their production overseas. Sales had slumped, and they probably thought the gig was up. After 1972, the quality of the cars produced, at least in my opinion, started to fall and this car is a good example of that fall in quality. The plastic on this interior looks pretty bad with the flashing all over the place. The fit and finish of this car is, well, not the best. The hood looks like it was an add-on. There are gaps at the seams and many uneven gaps, and I believe it was the YouTuber Techmoan that always says a measure of an item's quality is how easy it is to put back together. Well, I had a heck of a time getting this thing back together. It just doesn't seem to want to go back. The last item I need to work on is the windshield. I was surprised at how good a shape the plastic was given the condition of the body. There's only one major scratch on it and I think I can remove that with some 2000 grit wet sandpaper and a few minutes of polishing with some rubbing compound and then some polishing compound. With the windshield done I can go ahead and start trying to put the car back together. You might think the problem putting it back together is caused by the changes I made, but I normally take the cars apart and put them back together several times before I even start working on them. And it was then that I found that difficult. The cars are press fit together on an orbital riveter, so the pressure that originally held everything together is gone, 
and I had to really tighten the screws to get everything to go back into place. Modern cars Mattel makes today don't really suffer from this issue. I would guess this is due to computer-aided design that allows really complex modeling of the car before production. Go watch my video on the Gruma build. That car is not the most complex one I've ever seen, but still it's rather complex and well thought out. Most of the cars they make today just fall back together, when the ones from the late 70s into the 80s seem to want to just fall apart. That's not to say there's not any good quality cars during this time, there certainly are, but it's just not the quality we saw in 1968. So as I promised, here are the two original Super Chrome cars from around the same time and my restored car. Once again, what is most important to me is not that the car I'm working on is perfect, but that the car will fit in amongst its peers. In other words, I don't want you to be able to pick it out of a lineup. So let me know if you think it stands out below. Personally, I think it fits in rather well, but then again, I'm rather biased. Overall, I could have put in some extra work on this one. However, if you can't tell, this is not my favorite casting. And I was not sure how this would go as it was the first one I've ever tried using these techniques. So I didn't want to invest a huge amount of effort into something I wasn't sure would work. I definitely need to work on the ink flooding issue. This car did not have much detail to begin with, but the detail it did have is buried under the metal ink. So I need to work on that, and I might have found a way around it that I'll bring up in another video some other time. Anyway, let me know what you think of this video, and if you like the extra history bits added in. Over the years, I've read several books on Mattel and Lesney, and find their histories extremely fascinating. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.